Did you enjoy singing about the holiness of God? Like I even get chills down my spine when we're singing that. Give thanks. Uh, sometimes music can express our feelings more than anything else, right? It's wonderful to participate in it that way. Well, we're in Luke chapter 11, if you would like to turn there, please, and do be in prayer. I wish you could have all been here yesterday morning about uh, um, 8 o'clock, uh, not yesterday, but Friday morning as we were... Uh, gathering to send this group of 20. We took a picture out here on the front steps, 21 people from our little church headed down to Guatemala. And uh, we're really grateful for the opportunity God has given them down there and hope you'll be praying for them. Um, we did hear that Elaine has had this little accident uh, falling in a, uh, hit a hole and fell down and hurt her shoulder and twisted her ankle a little, so pray that uh, the pain will be minimized and uh, that there will be no serious damage there, but mostly pray that the ministry that they've gone down there to perform will be done under the ministry and the power and the direction of the Holy Spirit and that therefore great things will happen. Well, we've been considering the Lord's Prayer and uh, some of the implications of that. Um, one uh, one. Stories told of an old Scottish lady who was in a church, you know, in Scotland years ago where they had an enthusiastic young pastor, and uh, when he would get up for the morning, morning prayer, he would pray long with big theological words that uh, most of them didn't really understand. And after this had gone on for a while, I guess she thought she was old enough to be able to do this. She tapped him on the shoulder just before they're going in one morning, and she said, a bit of advice, pastor. Just call him Father and ask him for something. Just call him Father and ask him for something. And I thought, boy, that squares exactly with the advice Jesus gave here, wasn't it? When, when the disciple asked him, teach us to pray. God taught them to address him as Father. Gave them a short prayer with no long words. Five petitions. Seven if you take Matthew's version. As we started to look at this last week, we saw that, first of all, there are uh, needs related to God in this prayer, not really needs, but requests, and then secondly, there are requests related to us, needs related to God or petitions related to God. The first two, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and we saw that they, these, are, these are requests that God wants us to do to orient us. They, they help us take the big picture they help us see that it's about God, not about us. They help us see that we are made for him and not vice versa. Isaiah 42 and many other places. Prayer is therefore, prayer is therefore about aligning us with the will of God and not the other way around. Really important to get that. Now, so t today we want to begin then looking at the needs that relate to us. And we'll take the first one today. The fact that there are needs related to us in this prayer should give us great encouragement. You know, within the bigger framework of God's will, he has concerns for our personal needs. We are not made to be the center of our universe, let alone anyone else's universe. We should not be, but God is still very interested in the things that go on in our lives. So as our little planet makes its orbit around his sun, God cares about what's happening in our everyday life. We can bring him, therefore, our everyday requests. I think this prayer for our daily bread encompasses more than just daily bread. You need a car. You need a help at work of some kind. You know, whatever it is, we can bring these requests to God. God meets us where we are. He cares about us personally. And so let's look at this. Give us each day our daily bread. Simple request, right? Enough food for the day. And I believe by extension, he's talking about all of our physical needs. It's not just limited to our daily bread. This is here to represent 
the totality of our physical needs. Now, as I said, needs, not all of our physical desires, but our needs. We bring those to God. We're invited to pray for those. But I think in this very simple phrase, there are some really eye-opening lessons that we can learn when it comes to our physical needs. And so I want to take time this morning to look at those, try and detail those as they relate to this phrase. What does it teach us? Well, number one, it teaches us to be thankful. It teaches us to be thankful. I, um, for a lot of years, I thought it was interesting that the Lord's Prayer doesn't include thanksgiving. There is no specific comment in here that relates to thanksgiving. That's so key to the whole Bible that I thought it was a bit strange. But after, as I study this passage again, I I, kind of think it's there hidden in plain sight. And I think it's in this request. The verb is give. Give implies what? It's a gift. If there's a giver, there's a gift. And we're asking him to give what? Well, our daily physical needs. Now, Of course, God already knows what we need, right? He knows better than we do what we need. So why does he ask us to ask him for our physical needs if he already knows what we need? We're not giving him new information here. And I think the answer is, I think that this is an act of humility. It's an act of humility. This is recognizing the truth of James 1.17, where we read that every good gift and every perfect gift is coming from above, coming down from the Father of lights. In other words, the one who's created everything out of that abundance is giving to us what it is that we need. You have to humble yourself to come there, to recognize and to acknowledge that he is the source of all things, but that's what he would like us to do. And so, my asking is that once it's an act of humility, and I think also implied in that it's an act of thanksgiving. Meeting my needs is his gift, hence something to be thankful for. I ask, he gives. The only, the only logical response is to be thankful. I think Jesus exemplifies this so wonderfully. Look, at, look with me at John 11. If, if you're in Luke 11, hold your place there, but let's go over to John 11, the next book. John 11, this is the account of the feeding of 5,000. And there there Jesus stands one afternoon, 5,000 hungry men, been there all day listening to his preaching, milling around now, plus women and children, so probably a crowd of 10,000 or more are there, and they're all hungry. Jesus asks the disciples to feed them and they kind of laugh. Andrew eventually scrounges around and comes up with a little boy's lunch that consists of five loaves and two fish, five little barley loaves, a poor boy's lunch. That's all he can find, so he brings that to Jesus. What would you have done? I'll tell you what, on my best day, on my, on my absolutely best day, I'd have been desperately praying for more, wouldn't you? Desperately. How am I going to feed 10,000 people, five loaves and two fish? Look what Jesus did. John 6, verse 11. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. Now keep in mind, Jesus is acting in his human nature. It's the way he lived life here on earth. He takes these loaves, they're all that could be found, and he gives thanks for five rolls and two sardine-sized fish. Why? Because he trusted the Father, trusted him imminently, trusted him completely. He said, if that's what the Lord has given me, it must be enough. Well, there's a tremendous lesson there. And the lesson is this. Gratitude for what we already have is the starting point to unleash the power of God. Gratitude for what we already have is the starting point to unleash the power of God to provide whatever it is that we need. But we have to start with, are you thankful for what you've already got? 
That's the attitude suggested in give us this day, our daily bread. Secondly, I think it teaches us to be dependent. This little phrase teaches us to be dependent. Give us each day our daily bread. Nobody wants to be dependent, do they? It's, you know what? It's un-American to be dependent. We're taught from the time we're kids, right? Take care of yourself. Take care of your own. But think about this. The one physical need that Jesus picks on here to illustrate really, I think, all of our physical needs is what? Give us this day our daily bread. I mean, it doesn't get any more basic than that, right? It doesn't get any more basic than that. Daily bread is what we are to pray for. And the fact that Jesus urges us to pray for it suggests something, which is what? Well, it suggests that we can't do it on our own. It implies that we are inadequate for our most basic need. Man, think about that. I mean, that's, I, I, I mean, do, do you believe that? Because I'm, I'm guessing a lot of you are sitting here saying, well, what are you, what, I go out and earn my own living. What is this? Give us each day our daily bread. I'm taking care of that. I, I work hard to provide for my family. So what? I'm now, so I'm supposed to, you know, quit my job and, and just pray food onto the table? I don't think Jesus is suggesting that. He's not suggesting that you quit your day job. We know that. Second Thessalonians chapter three. The principle is if we ask God to do his part, we need to be willing to do our part, right? And so in 2 Corinthians 3, Paul instructs this way, 2 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse 10. He says this, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. That was because there were a few people in Thessalonica who decided to give up working because they thought the Lord was coming and so they quit work. Paul says, no, no, that's not the idea. If he doesn't work, you don't eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such person we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly to earn their own living. So keep on working. Don't ever suggest the Bible said to quit working, but why ask God for daily bread if I'm already earning it? Because, beloved, although we're doing our part, God has to do his part. Let me just take you down a quick road here. Who puts you in America where you have probably the best opportunity in the world to be able to have a job in the first place. Probably God did that, right? I don't think you got to vote when you were born, where you were gonna be. Who, who gave you the skills to do the job that you do every day to earn the living to come home and take care of your family? God did. Who gives you the health to continue to work? Assuming that you have the health to continue to work. God did that. Who keeps your company in business? Now, I know some of you are going to say, well, we got a lot of people that are worrying about that. Marketing people and sales people and all those guys. Yeah, we have all those people, but let me, let me, let me ask you, what would it take to put your company under? One little economic downturn, right? Some of you have been there. One new technology or one new product that makes what you're doing obsolete and you're out of a job. Doesn't take much, does it? A new employee who comes along and they're better, easier to get along with, do a better job. And suddenly what? You're out of a job. We are as dependent as newborn babies. That's the fact. Yeah, we work, but we only work with what God gives us. And so the principle is, we do what we can do, but we better be praying that God will continue to do what God does. You know, at Acts 17, verse 28, Paul, Paul tells us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit that it is in him that we live and move and have our being. So don't ever think you're it. It's very appropriate that we pray that God give us this day our daily bread, even though we have the wonderful privilege of pretty much knowing where it's coming from tomorrow. We're dependent. 
Turn with me to Exodus 16. Second book in the Bible, so easy to find, right? Exodus 16. Two million Israelites have just escaped from Israel under the leadership of Moses through the mighty intervention of God. But now they get out in the wilderness and there's no food. Two million people, no food. Not even two loaves, five loaves and two fish. And so in Exodus 16, verse four, we read, then the Lord God said to Moses, behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven. That's a unique way to supply food, isn't it? But I'm gonna rain bread from heaven for you and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them to see whether they will walk in my law or not. He said, I got a simple instruction. I'm just gonna give you enough for a day. I want you to go out and gather a day's worth and I wanna see if you'll obey. God is providing a day at a time, daily. On the sixth day, as you read down there further, you'll find out they could gather two days worth so that they didn't have to work on the Sabbath. But the principle is one day's worth of food on one day can be gathered. What is he teaching them? Dependence. He doesn't give them a year's worth at a time, not a month's worth, not a week's worth, a day's worth. Now, please note that even here, God didn't, God didn't just put it on the table, right? God could have just as easily piled up that manna in the tents as to pile out there on the desert floor, right? But he put it out there so they would have to do their part. After he did his part, they did their part and they came and picked it up and brought a day's worth in and put it in their tent and that's what they ate. What he's teaching them is you are dependent on me, but you do your part. You work as well, a day at a time. So how'd they do? Verse 19, did they pass the test? Verse 19, Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over till morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning and it bred worms and stank. That's the past tense of stink. I, you know, it's a strange word, isn't it? Stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning, they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. I, I, I tell you, I'd been right there with them. I would, wouldn't you? I would have been gathering enough for several days. You know, why go out, you know, every day when you can get enough for one day that'll last a week and bring it in, save it up, but that's not the plan. What's God teaching them? He's teaching them, you need me. Every day. You need me every day. Beloved, these things are in the Bible. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 for our instruction. He does big things and he does sometimes a little bit strange things so that we get the big picture. And the picture here is you need me every day. You don't always see it this way. You don't have to go out and gather manna every morning. So you don't have that impression that you need me every day. But I gave this lesson to them so that you'll know you need me every day. Not just some days, every day. Now, does this mean that no savings, no, no plans for retirement, shouldn't be putting anything away for contingencies? That would miss the point altogether, beloved. The, the Bible is filled with instructions that we need to be prepared. I, I can think of Proverbs where, where God uses the illustration of the ant. He says, go check out the ant. Proverbs chapter six, verse eight. He says, the ant prepares her food in summer and gathers her food in harvest, planning ahead, being prepared. God commends it. He's not against it. He is against piling it up just so we can, you know, selfishly consume it on our own lusts. That was the problem with the rich guy who was gonna build more barns because he didn't have enough to store it all. We can overdo, but we, can, but we certainly can ha have room to be prepared. But his point is don't depend on the job. Don't be, d depend on the bank account. Don't depend on the 401k. It's wonderful that you've got it, but your dependence is on, is on me. I am the one that you need every day. I'm your security, trust me. I learned a lot about dependence, 1988. It's a, 
The last quarter of that year is firmly fixed in my mind. I went, took a trip to Florida to check on an acceptance test that was about to start down there for a statewide automated fingerprint identification system for the company that I was working for at the time. And a man who was a program manager who reported to me was running that program. I just wanted to make sure everything was going okay. When I got down there, I found a program that was in deep, deep trouble. All kinds of functionality lacking. It had been late. I ended up spending three months myself there working with a team of 20 engineers, 16, 18 hours a day, sometimes 20. I can remember more than one night laying my head on the pillow very early in the morning knowing that in three hours I was going to be getting up and going again. I didn't think we could make it. The customer didn't think we could make it either, so they imposed a huge performance bond on us. And we had to accept it because we were already late. It was a performance bond that would have taken the company under if we hadn't been able to get through. So we were, we, you know, we were doing testing during the day, and then during the night, new software for functionality that had to be tested the next day was coming in from Anaheim over phone lines or whatever way we could use to get it there, sometimes not very well tested itself, and that's the, that's the way we were maneuvering for three months. It was a very strenuous time. In the first week or two, Man, my stomach was churning, my gastric juices were going over time until I finally came to the point of realizing, wait a minute, Philippians 4, 6 says, I shouldn't be worried about anything. But I need to commit this to the Lord. The Lord was teaching me a lesson in dependence, and so I began to get to the place where we worked as hard as we could all day and half the night, and then I'd say, Lord, okay, it's over to you for tomorrow. I quit worrying about it. I learned dependence. I can still remember the day about a week before this all thing was supposed to be all done when for the first time I thought maybe. <laughs> I can remember saying that to one of the engineers. I think maybe I see light at the end of the tunnel here. There were still a few hurdles to get through, but God brought us through. But here's the, here's the point, beloved. The point is we're just as dependent as that every day. We just don't realize it. And what God is doing by this prayer is he's saying, I want you to acknowledge that even in the most basic ways, you need me. Thirdly, it teaches us to be trusting, right? You say, well, isn't dependence and trust, aren't they the same thing? And I think, not really. You can be dependent but not be trusting. You, your life could be characterized by constant anxiety. You're dependent but trembling, and God wants you to be dependent but trusting. Two different things, right? So, so he wants us to be not only dependent, but he wants us to be trusting in him. Give us each day our daily bread. Now, there's an obvious question in that phrase that usually gets skipped right over. And the question is this, why does Jesus say each day, and then he goes on to say daily? Wouldn't one or the other be sufficient? Why does he use two phrases here? And the answer to that question hinges on the word daily, the word daily. It's the Greek word epiousios, epiousios. It's a difficult word because it's not found anywhere else in the Greek language. And I, I don't mean just in the, it's not found anywhere else in the New Testament. It's not found in any Greek documents that we have dating from that time at all. It's a lost word in essence. So it's gotten translated daily because of the context that it's in here. But nobody knows, and I mean, I've researched every scholar I know Nobody knows exactly what this word means. But let me give you one clue. It comes from a guy that I ran into. His name is Kenneth Bailey. He's a scholar who lived most of his life in the Middle East. And he came across a translation of the Bible of the New Testament in Syriac from the second century. So it's pretty close to the first century. Second century Syriac translation. Syriac is very close to Aramaic, which is, which is probably the, the language, that, what would have been the language that Jesus spoke most of the time. And the Syriac translation of this word translates it with the Syriac word 
Ameno, A-M-E-N-O, Ameno. And the word Ameno means lasting, never ceasing, perpetual. So I think there's a good possibility what this means, what this word means here is an everlasting supply. That what Jesus' phrase would read would be something like this, give us each day our bread that never runs out. Give us our bread that's perpetual. Give us from the supply, think of it another way, God gives us a daily allotment from, a, from an eternal supply that has our name written on it. Give us this day our bread that never runs out. I don't know about you, but man, I think that's cool. I think that's amazing that God would say, I, I, I'm gonna give to you, but I'm just, I, and I got a supply here that's never ending, you'll never run out, but I'm just gonna give it to you a little at a time. Give it to you as you need it. There's a wonderful promise in Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33, verse 25, says, as your days are, so will your strength be. As your days are, so will your strength be. That's a reminder. God doesn't usually give us a lot of excess. He gives us what we need for when we need it. And I think that's what, we're, what he's asking us to pray for here. Pray for what we need, when we need it, but coming from a supply that's never going to run dry. There was, a, there was a guy in the Navy who had a, he had a vital piece of equipment that wasn't working, and so he called the supply depot and asked for you know, a replacement piece of equipment. It was rather old, and the guy at the supply depot says, I'm not even sure we have this, let me check. He got on his computer, he came back, and he said, I just checked, he said, we don't have that part. It's not available anywhere in the world. You're gonna have to try somewhere else. <laughs> what? <laughs> It's not available anywhere else in the world and I'm going to have to try somewhere else? That would be a problem if you were a Navy guy. But for, for the believer, beloved, it's no problem. You have a supply depot outside this world that never runs out. God has every need supplied. It's all built up, it's all there. It's just a question of asking for it. So God is saying, trust me, got an unending supply. Fourth thing this passage teaches us, I think it teaches us to be content. I think it teaches us to be content. Give us our daily bread. I don't know about you, but I'm a little disappointed, right? There's nothing about dessert there. Nothing, <laughs> right? Nothing. No indication that dessert is on the menu. So let me ask you this. Does that mean God doesn't want us to have and enjoy good things? Because I think sometimes you could listen to us preachers and you'd think that's what he, what he desires. I don't believe so. you got to compare other scripture with other scripture, right? And he says in 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, he says that it's God who richly supplies us with everything to enjoy. It's not a matter of how much we have or don't have, but it's a, it's a question of where our hope is, where our trust is, where our certainty is. And what he's urging in, give us this day our daily bread, is let your certainty be in me. If I give you over and above, enjoy it. Now, you also get a couple out with Ephesians 4 when he says, when I give to you, share with others. But enjoy it. But don't let it run you. I love how Solomon says this. This ought to be, I mean, this ought to be kind of imprinted, I think, on all of our minds. Solomon in Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9. Some of you remember this passage, but, but Solomon says this, two things I ask of you, he's praying to God, two things I ask of you, deny them, not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. That ought to be a prayer for all of us, right? And then he goes on and he says, and give me neither poverty nor riches. Neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I should be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? 
or lest I should be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. That's exactly the spirit of Jesus' prayer, encouraging us to ask the Lord for our daily needs, but seeing the danger in wanting beyond that. Paul said almost the same thing, didn't he, in Philippians 4? Remember that passage in Philippians 4, verses 11 and 12, where he says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I, you know, whatever the Lord gives me is good with me. Sometimes I've had a lot, sometimes I've had little, sometimes I've been in palaces, sometimes I've been lying on the road left for dead. Contentment allows us to focus on the things that really matter. And it's implied in this. Give us each day our daily bread. Let us focus on things that really matter. You know, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about contentment, however. You know, sometimes we think, okay, contentment. So I'm supposed to be content should never have any ambition, right? Does that mean a lack of ambition? Some people would suggest, you know, that to seek advancement, to seek improvement, a new or better job or what else, you shouldn't do that. Is that, is that what contentment means? I don't, I don't think that's what it means, beloved. Here's the question that we must always ask of our ambition. Do I desire this and do I want this and do I have this ambition in order to further the mission that God's made me for, or do I desire this to consume it on my own personal lusts? Which James assures us is a prayer the Lord will not answer, right? What's the motivation? To desire to be the best you can be in order to accomplish what God has asked you to do is a wonderful ambition. But let, 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 me, let me give you another definition for contentment. Contentment Contentment is ambition under the control of a loving Heavenly Father. Contentment is ambition under the control of a loving Heavenly Father. Contentment is a desire to go as far as I can, to do as much as I can, but for the sake of the Father that I'm serving. Contentment is furthermore, there's a second question that goes along with it, and that is, okay, if I'm asking God for advancement, I'm asking God for something, am I willing to accept whatever answer God gives? Am I submissive to his will? Am I willingly accepting any advancement or any demotion that he may bring? I don't know about you, I've been through both. I suspect most of us have been at some point in time. The question is, can we accept that as coming from him? Contentment is not lack of inertia. I mean, it's not lack of ambition, but it's ambition under the control of a loving heavenly father so we can do what he wants us to do better and then accepting his answer as the answer that he knows is right. Contentment means to commit all my efforts and ideas and dreams and ambitions to him. Knowing he'll do what's best. And I'll tell you, that's a good place to be. Did you hear about the two teardrops? They're, you know, they're floating down the river of life, right? And the first teardrop says to the second one, I, well, hey, I, w nice to meet you, where are you from? And the second one says, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a teardrop from a girl who loved a, who loved a man and, and lost him. Who are you? And the first one says, oh, I'm, the, I'm a teardrop from the girl that got him. <laughs> Think about it, folks. I mean, it's, it's, it's better than that. <laughs> I must have told it badly. The, po the point is, we don't know what's best all the time, right? We don't. We think we do. But only God does. And so contentment is willing to put it all in his hands and say, okay, Lord, whatever you're going to do. If you get us through this acceptance test and the company doesn't go under and I still got a job, great. If you take the company down because we fail in this acceptance test, then we'll, I'm ready to move on. Hard things come sometimes in life, right? 
That's why we're talking in Sunday school this morning. That's why Paul prays in Philippians 3 that we will have strength, that we'll have strength to accept the love of Christ. Why would you need strength to accept love from anybody? Because sometimes the love, beloved, is difficult and hard. Give us this day our daily bread, content with the daily needs, letting God add as he sees fit to do. Fifthly, fifth thing, last thing, I'm sure it's not the last one here, but the last one we'll consider, it teaches us to be generous, right? It teaches us to be generous. Give us this day our daily bread. It's interesting, Here's, you know, there's, there's kind of a good lesson in Bible interpretation here. Sometimes, you know, you wanna ask, when you're, when you're studying a passage, ask what it's not saying. Sometimes what it's not saying is as important as what it says. And what you'll notice in this passage is there's not the word I or me is never there, right? It's missing. It's not give me my daily bread. It's what? Give us each day our daily bread. God is wanting us to be concerned about others at the same time we're concerned about ourselves. There's an implied generosity in this request that isn't necessarily on the surface, but it's there. For so many of us, our prayers are kind of like this, you know, God bless me and my wife, you know, our son John and his wife, us four, no more. It's kind of the way we, we, I mean, we, went up, we might not throw that last phrase in there quite like that, but you know, if you looked at the essence of our prayers, that's what they are. And this prayer is suggesting, no, no, that's not where I want you to go. I want you to be concerned for others as well, not just for yourself. There's, there's, a, there's a plurality here for a reason. And Jesus is teaching us to see beyond our needs equally to those of others. I mean, it's, you just go back to what, you know, what is the essence of the law? To love God, the Lord our God, with all our heart, strength, soul, and might. And to love our neighbor as ourself. I think we're very focused on self, not very little on our neighbor, right? Give us our daily bread. So, so what this passage is teaching and what this phrase is particularly teaching is that we need to acknowledge that we need God even for the most basic things in life. The story is told of some scientists, you know, who decided to, they didn't need God anymore. This, could be probably true of a lot of scientists, but they didn't need God anymore, and so they decided to send a delegation to God to inform him of this. It's an apocryphal story, you understand, right? <laughs> so they show up before God, and they say, God, we, don't, we just want you to know we don't need you anymore. We can clone people. We can walk on the moon. We can split the atom. We are, we're, we're able to read the DNA code, so we know, you know, we're the, 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 very, the very basic information that leads to life, we, we got it, we know it, we're self-sufficient, we don't, we don't need you anymore. And God said, okay, you guys are scientists, right? Yeah, right. So let's test your theory. Oh, sure, okay, let's test it. What's the test? God said, well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's see you create a man from dust just like I did Adam. Let's just start at the beginning. Create a man from dust like I created Adam. So one of the scientists, you know, grabs a, grabs a handful of dirt and said, okay, yeah, that's sure, that's okay. And God says, wait a minute, you go find your own dust. <laughs> huh? We need God for the most basic things in life that we think we have covered. Do you see? We need him for everything. Give us this day our daily bread. It isn't there, beloved, just for show. It's to remind us that there's not a need in our life that we're not dependent upon him for. The good news is what Paul says in Philippians 4.19, you ask, and he says, and my God will supply every need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That's a wonderful promise, isn't it? It's all there, but you gotta ask. His riches are more than we'll ever need. I, I think of this, you could give a million accounts of this, but Paul Miller in his little book, of A Life of Prayer, it's a wonderful book if you haven't read it, Paul Miller, A Life of Prayer. He tells how once in his life, he and his wife 
Jill ran out of bread. They were in college at the, sem at the time, seminary actually, and he was supporting his wife and a daughter. He supported them by painting during the day when he had time, but by New Year's Day, 1975, they'd run out of food, money, and work. They had sold, you know, all their jewelry, anything they had that was of any value, their books. He said they had even sold their high school rings. I can't imagine how much that would have brought, but they had sold everything. He said, having done everything we could, we sat down to the last meal, New Year's night, 1975. We thanked the Lord for that meal and then prayed for daily bread the next day. He said, we had no more stopped praying than the phone rang. And a woman said, I need you to come and paint tomorrow. So the next day he showed up ready to go to work, but he told her how she was God's answer to his prayer. And she said, oh, maybe you need to be paid in advance. And she gave him advance payment. Beloved, it's that, it's that wonderful. That's the promise that God gives us. That's what he's asking us to pray for. That's the kind of dependence that he wants us to be living with. That's the recipe. Do what you can. But trust God to meet your needs. And guess what? He will. He will. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, the, for this word. We thank you for the uh, encouragement that it gives. Assures us that you are interested in our needs. But Lord, I think it goes way, way deeper than that. I think you're asking us to pray for those daily needs, the most basic, the thing that we think we've got most easily covered. You're asking us to pray for that, to remind us you don't have anything covered. Without you, we don't have anything covered. And so it puts us, Lord, where we belong in the grand scheme of things, dependent on a heavenly Father who thankfully loves us and will supply every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Thank you for that assurance. Thank you for reminding us that that's how we need to pray because we surely need that reminder. Help us to go and put this into practice, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.